That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. Hmm? Michael's rushing in. Is he? Yeah. Is he? Should we wait for Michael? Yeah. <laughs> He's rushing in. So always laughing. To tell my wife all my uncles are bold, and it's like, what happened to me? <laughs> Where are you, Michael? We should wait till someone comes online. Oh, there it is. Morning, Dina. Waiting for you to get online. <laughs> so we can begin. I'm glad you got us. All right, let's go ahead and, and pray. Uh, gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. What a beautiful weekend it was lord so much was done lord it's a, a blessing on sunday father to have your people here uh, gathered lord to hear your word father the fellowship the giving away lord of, of food to many many people that were in need father what a blessing that was father to see people have food and provide for their family lord god and it was an extra blessing to see uh people stay afterwards father much after there was at least Three, I believe, three or four people that were out there, Father, in wheelchairs that we were able to help, Father. And they were just fellowshipping under the canopy, and it was just neat to see that, Lord. And sometimes I, I, I try to think uh, how Jesus must have felt when he fed the multitude and as he was watching them eating and so forth. It must have made him feel good that he was able to provide for them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you provide for us so that we could provide for others, Lord. Now provide your word. Let it be nourishment to our spiritual souls, Father. And challenge us, Lord God. Uh, Lord, we have so much of the world in us, Lord, from the past uh, because of our, our social background, Lord, our ethnic background, Father, uh, the things that we've been taught by the school system, by, by our friends, by what we've read in the past that was secular and not biblical. And there's just so much junk in our minds and what we believe. And we need those things uh, removed, Father. We need to replace them with your truth, Father. And how do I know these things are true? Because sometimes, Lord, um, I post things, Lord, and, and I read them later. And I'm like, where did that come from? That's not biblical. Sometimes I, I make comments or even post pictures. And, and those pictures aren't really what should be posted, Father. Help us, Lord, so that we better represent you, Father that we're careful in what we post on Facebook, what we say, and, and, what, and how we live, Lord, in front of people, Lord. And I just thank you, Lord, that you're patient and so merciful to us, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come and join us here at 5383 Martin Street, in Harupa Valley. And today we're in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and we're actually going to finish it up here in chapter 3. So let's dig into it as Paul continues to give instructions uh, to the church there in Thessalonica. And he's with uh, Salvinus and Timothy, and he says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from the unreasonable and wicked men for all or, or for not all have faith. So Paul is asking for prayer. How important is prayer? Well, back in First Thessalonians, I believe it was uh, chapter four or no five, he said in verse 17, pray without ceasing. Uh, Jesus gave the disciples a model on how to pray, right? He said, this is how you pray. He didn't give them a prayer. He gave them a model to pray. So he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So this is an outline on how you should pray. Always start with the Father, you know, and, and who he is, what his name is, that he sits in the kingdom. And, and you can expound upon each one of those little points that Jesus gives there. So prayer is very important. Prayer is the power that God gives us to get things done on our behalf. And so we need to pray more. In fact, in handling any situation, you should always handle it in prayer first. And in making any decision, you should make it in prayer first. And not just try to make that decision on your own. So he says, pray for me. 
Uh, what does he ask for prayer? That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. So his priorities are right, right? That the word of the Lord be first, you know, because it's the word of the Lord that we're to live by. James says in chapter 1, verse 21, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we ought to be doing the word of God, living the word of God, applying the word of God to our lives. Uh, that's for every believer, not just for pastors and leadership and ministry leaders, for every one of us to apply that scripture. Jesus was tempted by Satan, right? up there in the, on the mountain, and set, Satan tempted him on many, many points. And there was a point where Jesus was hungry because he'd been fasting, and Satan offered him some bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word, by every word of God that proceed from his mouth. And so the word going out is more important than the food that we eat, you know. Uh, so we need to pray that God would give us a voice to share the gospel. Uh, our church uh, was suffering a little bit yesterday. It was Forrest's uh, birthday. He would have been 25. He passed away when he was 22, so it's been three years since he passed away. Uh, he was hit by a vehicle here at Harupa Valley, and the Riverside sheriffs uh, have not been able to catch the person uh, that that hit him and so yesterday was a little difficult for some as they were celebrating his his birthday um, but when he passed away and here's my point uh, when all the newscasters came out to the church we had a vigil on a Friday and I know we had about three to four hundred people here and you had all the news stations parked on the outside ABC uh, channel 9, 11, channel 2, channel 4, even a Spanish station uh, was was here. And every time they came up to me, because I was a senior pastor, and they used me as the reference point, they did go to other people, but they used me. I, I shared the story, but I also mixed it in with the gospel. And I was cognizant of it so that I would kind of mix it in so they couldn't cut my words out. So I would say a few things and then share about Jesus and then say a few things. So they, otherwise it would have been really funny. And I was trying to do that and say, Lord, give me some wisdom here. But I was able to get the gospel out. Uh, so every one of those stations heard the gospel. Now, my son at the time and, and some of the youth, you know, they were like so excited about the opportunity. So I think it was channel, I think it was channel four that, or channel two that came to them. And they immediately said, this isn't about Forrest, this is about Jesus Christ, and Christ came to die for sins for sinners. And they just went off, boom, and they never showed that clip, never showed it. So you gotta use some wisdom, right? Because the world's gonna cut that off. And that's what Paul's saying here. Pray that the word go out, that no one cut it off. You know, and then he prayed, he asked for prayer for, him, for himself, delivered from unreasonable wicked men, for all have, or not all are of faith. So there were men that were bugging the Apostle Paul during this time, it really wasn't the Roman government that was persecuting the church. It was the Jewish people, the Sanhedrin, that were really persecuting the, the church of Christ. They were putting so much pressure on them like the Apostle Paul did, but now Paul's life has changed. And so they were uh, putting so much pressure and persecuting the Jews. And so these are Jews persecuting the Jews. They're Jews that a lot of Jews at times were saying, you know, it's not worth it being a Christian. We're going to go back to Judaism. So they were falling away from the faith. And so Paul realized that there's wicked men out there that are not of the faith, and they're just trying to persecute people and bullying them to leave the faith. And many were. So he wanted prayer for that. But the Lord, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And of course, the evil one is tied in with the evil wicked men, right? He's the, he's the God of this world system. He's what runs uh, everything in this world, and he governs over those men that are out there that are wicked. Um, yeah, I was just reading an article. I guess they found some evidence to uh, Clinton visiting this pleasure island, who this man owned, who was a pedophiler. I said that right, right? Yeah, I finally said it right. Um, 
they thought Clinton had been over there maybe once or twice. Well, they found a ledger, and it was more than once and twice. Wow. It's been more than a dozen times, if not double a dozen times, with ledgers, his name written on there, and also other officials that have been to this place. And the plane having rooms for uh, multiple sex partners and things like that as you go over to this place. So the evidence is all there. It's wicked. And it all stems from the wicked one because he wants to destroy uh, humanity. Verse 4 says, We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now that's the heart of Paul, that he's not just writing and it's falling on deaf ears. You know, sometimes you, you, you're teaching from the pulpit and you look out there and you wonder, are they really listening? <laughs> or is it just kind of going in? My dad used to say, it's going in one ear and it just comes out the other and it falls on the ground. Uh, I'm telling you so you can do it. Don't be like the monkey. Monkey see, but monkey don't do. You know, and he would tell us these things all the time. You know, you have to do it, not just let it fall on dead ears. Uh, those that um, oftentimes uh, falls on dead ears and they don't do it, 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 it's because they don't care. They don't think it's right. It's amazing what the percentage is of Christians that believe that the Bible is the Word of God. They'll say, yes, it's the Word of God, but then you'll ask them, is what's in it? true and they'll say well a lot of it is so how can it be the word of god but then a lot of it is not the word of god it doesn't make any sense but it's because it challenges their thinking and, and we live in a culture today that has taught us how to think right you go to the school system and they teach us how to think they indoctrinate us and that's a lot of garbage that's in our life and we come to the lord now we've got to get rid of that garbage and replace it with truth and it takes a long time to do that a long time it's a life journey but it's something that we should actively always be trying and be praying about. Asking God, Lord, replace my thoughts with other thoughts that would more glorify you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. And now he gives some command here, which is very difficult, verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw. Now, the word withdraw there in the Greek means keep away or avoid, okay? Keep away or avoid from every brother who walks disorderly. He didn't say from the brother that you think you should keep away. He says from every brother who walks disorderly or, Ill, or irregularly is another word to use there and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, <clears throat> but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So he's talking about disorderly people, people that are not living for Christ, people that are really affecting the church. And it's not in a good way. It's in a negative way. And if there are people in the church that are affecting the church in a negative way, then you need to stay away from those people. It's okay to stay away from them because they're not walking the way they should. Now, let me clarify this because I know there's a lot of questions on this. You know, if you have a new believer, then obviously, you know, they're learning. So you have to have grace and patience with them. And that's why he says that in the beginning, uh, the patience of Christ. So you have to understand that. They're not purposely trying to be disorderly or, or irregular. There's time of growth. So you have to understand that. But you have a seasoned believer that's actually walking disorderly and trying to convince others to walk disorderly. Then, yeah, you have to confront that. And as a church, we have to confront that. And then we have to, you know, ask them to leave the church. And then we can't have fellowship. Now, if it's within the Christian circle, then that holds true. If it's within your own family, then that's a choice that you have to make. You have to choose to not walk with them because they're walking disorderly. And that's a hard thing to do. We've done it in the past where we have separated ourselves from someone that calls themselves a believer, but then they're not living like a believer and they make some bad choices. And so we just withdraw. We love them 
And if there was a family event, we'd go to it and we'd see them. Hello, how are you? And then we'd move on. But we didn't have fellowship with them. And it worked. As God said, it should work. It should draw them back because it, it brings shame to how they're living and it should cause them to repent. And in this case, you know, it did. And I know that is hard to receive and hard to believe because it's a hard thing to do, especially if it's someone you love very dearly. I remember um, somebody disagreed with me. There was another Christian who said, that's harsh. And as a pastor, you should never do something like that. And they actually ended up calling Chuck on the radio. Uh, on Was it for every man? An answer, right? And uh, it was aired. And they asked Chuck, Chuck, this is what's going on, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? And Chuck's like, well, uh, as hard as that is, you know, it's the truth and he's doing the right thing. You know, and so they, they got their answer, you know, right there. And it is a hard thing, uh, but it works and it's effective. Now, do people do it? Do they apply that? Not all the time. Not all the time. Um, they allow the sinful person to live in their household. Uh, let's get a little bit more detailed. What if the person is in your home and they're a practicing homosexual? What do you do? And they call themselves a Christian, okay? Now, if they're not a Christian, that's a different thing. I would take the opportunity to share with them, love them, care for them, you know, and hopefully they'll repent and turn. Let them know that it's sinful, but so is every other sin. You know, it's sinful too, and it's going to keep them away from, from Christ. But ultimately, it's their rejection of Christ. But if they're a Christian, and they call themselves a Christian, and they're living that way, then they shouldn't be living in your home. But again, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, but they've already come to God. You know, their salvation is already there, but they're living this lifestyle. Can you be a practicing homosexual and go to heaven? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not if you're practicing, but how long is practicing? That's particular, right? And we don't know because the prodigal son was practicing sinfulness for quite a while until he ran out of all resources. And then the Lord got hold of him and he sent him back. So we don't know those things. So we have to make our decisions based on the moment of that particular action that's happening and say, okay, your lifestyle's not in accordance with the Bible and you're calling yourself a believer. So, you know, at this point you need to leave until you decide that it's not how I ought to live. And then you're more than welcome to come back. We want you to come back and make that very clear. Though that's hard to do, I know, and I get it. So you have to decide uh, on your case, uh, you, you know, case by case, the particulars and whether it warrants it or not. And that comes with a lot of prayer. So Paul here is saying, you know, uh, keep away, avoid those who walk disorderly, but follow his example. And then he goes on in verse 11, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busy bodies. They're busy bodies. Um, that's the disorderly thing, is they're going from place to place gossiping, talking about other people. Uh, one group of people, another group of people, and they're just going back and forth. Paul talked about widows, right? Especially young widows. Be careful because they're in the church and young widows seem to have a tendency. Now, I'm not saying all and don't... You know, say the pastor said all young widows know, but there are some young widows that just have a tendency to go over and talk and talk and talk. Uh, there was a pastor that was sharing about someone that had come to his church uh, for a job, and they hired them, but the person had um, ulterior motives. They actually wanted to be in ministry and be a teacher, and, and so instead of working, they were busybody talking to everybody. You know, about this and that and this and that. And then they realized, and they started asking other people, do you see him working? No, usually he just starts talking with someone and he's there for an hour. Then he goes over there and, to, you know, so they end up firing him because he's not doing his job. He's just a busybody, you know, going back and forth. So uh, these, this is a disorderly manner of, of walking. Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren... Do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. That's pretty clear, right? That's pretty clear. I struggle with this. You know, I struggle with this. Now, nowhere in here did he say that that you need to um, broadcast it anywhere, right? Uh, 
he's talking to us personally and he's telling us that when you see someone like this, you just note it. Note it down in your head, do a mental note, or if you need to do it on a, on a phone or a notepad, and this person is not one that you wanna be uh, hanging around with. Avoid that person, stay away from that person. Um, <clears throat> don't make him your enemy, but just don't you know, uh, fellowship with him. Now he didn't say broadcast it from the pulpit and let everybody know that, or that you go around telling everybody. You just need to stay away from them. And there are some people that, that you need to stay away from because they're not helpful. They're more destructive than anything else. <clears throat> and hopefully that person will be ashamed as it says there. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother or warn him. Now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, in the, in the end, Paul really does desire that there be peace in our lives. Why does he want us to have peace? Because that's what God wants. That's what Jesus wants. My peace I came to give you, you know, not as the world gives, but this is the peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's a peace that puts its faith and trust in God, even though it doesn't see uh, with the eyes and feel with the hands and feel with the heart. It is a peace that walks by faith and trust in God because God is a more than able to take care of our needs. God is able to provide for us. God is able to take care of situations and financial stuff. God is able. God is able to do that. Uh, he is more than able, and we've seen him for those of you that have been here long enough, you've seen him do that in our little church, you know, here so many times provide for us if we just trust in him uh, because he wants to give us peace. Uh, he's not going to get rid of the troubles and the tribulations, but he's going to give us peace while in the troubles and tribulations, right? He can calm the storm as he did with the disciples, but they still had to get through the storm, right? You remember they were all in a storm and Jesus was in the bottom of the boat and he was asleep as they were all looking at the storm and probably trying to do as much as they could to you know weather out the storm they probably went and got and tied down everything and make sure stuff was in the, uh, tied up and you no know, sails were up <clears throat> you know the weight was balanced and they're trying everything you guys stand over there we'll stand over here and just let's keep the boat you know and like where's jesus i don't know but let's try this and get in the front get in the back and you know the all this is going on <clears throat> where's jesus they all, you know, some like, oh, he's in the bottom and he's asleep. <laughs> I love that picture. I love that picture. It reminds me of the of the picture of the little bird. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a picture, and it kind of, um, it, it's several pictures, but the first picture is a little bird, and you see it just chirping away happily. And it's inside a little, it's in a little crevice of a rock. And you're going, wow, look at that little bird, how cute, she's surfing away. And then the next picture, it pulls back and you see it's a bigger rock. And then it pulls back, it's a huge rock. It pulls back more and there's waves crashing on the rock. And water splashing all over the place, you know. And you see this whole storm happening around this little bird, but it's inside the little rock. And it's chirping away. It's, got, it's found peace within the rock, right? And there's Jesus in the bottom of the boat and he's asleep. It's like, yeah, so there's a storm. <laughs> I can calm storms, so I'm not worried about it, you know? And if absent from the body is present with the Lord, you know? But God's got a plan for me. I know where I have to go in several years from now, and I have to die for the sins of the world. So he's not taking us now, guys. So I'm not worried about it at all. And so he was asleep. And of course, when they woke him up, and he's like, oh, you a little faith, <laughs> you know? It's like, haven't you seen enough? Like the children of Israel, Ten, 10 miracles, and yet they were still complaining, still wanting God to do something. Why did you bring us out here? You know, and then now they're, we're going to see on Wednesday, um, they're now at the promised land, the land of Canaan, and they're going to send spies down there to spy out the land and to see if it's takeable. To see if it's takeable? Really? God already said it's yours. He already divided it up uh, among them, and yet they're going to see if it's takeable. No, there are things that God has promised us and we need to believe him. And so like that bird, we need to rest in the rock, the rock of our salvation, which is Jesus Christ himself. 
He's the rock of our salvation, and we can rest in him completely. I was sharing again the story, and it's just the, a recent one, and there will be many more. But I was sharing a story the other day as we were talking about the remodeling of the church, which we have probably more than two-thirds of, uh, two of the church remodeled. We have the bathrooms and my office, and that's it. And then the whole inside of the church is done. But our resources have dropped, right? And so we have only so much. And I knew that we could probably get some new cabinets in the bathrooms and maybe paint, and that's about it. <clears throat> so I knew that. But at the same time, I remember praying and walking, because I come here early and I walk around in the chairs and I pray, like Joshua walking around Jericho, and I just pray. And I go around the other way, so it works both sides of the muscles. And um, I remember saying, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, but Lord, do something so we can get those bathrooms done, you know? Just do something, Lord. And, and this was months ago that I was, I was praying this, you know, and I was telling this to, to I think, you guys the other day. And then all of a sudden, uh, somebody came to church. Uh, they they want to help out the church. They're now involved in the church. They want to do something for the church. And, and they came the other day, and they were watching me in the in the uh, foyer area, and they're looking, what are you going to do with the bathrooms? I go, well, this is all we've got. And uh, I said, oh, well, let me, let me take some measurements. You know? So they took some measurements, and they came back. and said, you know what? How about if we just handle it? I'm like, what do you mean? We'll just take care of it all. We'll, we'll open it up. We'll put new tile. We'll put new cabinets. We'll make it all, you know, the way it is compliance, you know? And I'm like, really? Yeah, and I'm like, wow, Lord, you are amazing. <laughs> he heard my prayer. He heard it from months ago, and he sent the answer. And I said, you know, you, you know God sent you here. You know, yeah, I know that. I'm like, yeah, I do too. See, God does that, and he continues to do that, and he will continue to do that. He wants us to have peace in him, even though there seems to be a dilemma, a situation that's arising. And I think that when we stand there and say, you know what, Lord, you're going to handle that. I'm not going to even think about it. Because my worrying and care, well, you know, the... The gray is turning, and I add a little black trying to control it, but eventually it's going to be all gray. I can't control it. I, don't know, I can't control the numbers of hair that fall off. I wish I could, but they keep falling. Every time I brush, I'm like, oh, there's another couple. Um, you know, <laughs> counting down to when I'm five on the head. I don't know how many there will be one day. You know, and then I start thinking, let me see, 57. I'm figuring about 62, I'll be, I'll be bald. <laughs> you know? I'm just like worried about this. And it's like, Lord, take away that worry. Who cares? You know, help me not to care. But those are my struggles. You know, he wants us to have peace. He wants us to have peace. So Apostle Paul wants us to have peace. And that's why I teach you, trust God. He's going to do something. You know, I want you to have peace. And you should want your children to have peace. And that's what you teach your children. And we teach one another this truth. So let's pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That no matter what situation we're in, Lord, we can trust God. What's the worst that can happen to us? That you take our life and we go to heaven? That's not too bad, Lord. That's a great deal. But, Lord, we lose everything. Lord, I see people every day who've lost everything, and yet they have such peace and joy in their lives, Lord, as they live out of their vehicle, Father as they live in someone else's home or garage, Lord. But yet, Lord, they have that peace of God that surpasses all understanding. This is not our home. The home that we have is not our home. Amen. It's all yours, Lord. But we thank you for what you do give us, Lord, what you do provide for us, Lord. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us, Father. We pray, Father, today that you would get us through the day, number our steps as we walk throughout the day, that we may get the things we need to get done, Father. And have those divine appointments that maybe you want to interrupt our day so that we can minister and pre preach the gospel, that the word would go out, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> if you have any prayer requests, please uh, post them or private message me, and we will pray for them. Have a wonderful day.